Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Sorry, we are a little bit late today. We're having some issues on the N3 and getting all our people here. But we're giving up now and we're going to start. <laughs> so today's Journal Club is... Um, going to be presented by me and Dr. Uh, James Fulton. We're going to give you guys some feedback on the recently attended Euro Also ECMO Congress, which was really a privilege to attend. There were some pearls that we didn't know quite a lot. <laughs> we learned way too much to share in one hour, but we've picked out, we think, the highlights of that experience. Okay, so besides buying all the books, um, which anyone is welcome to just reach out to us if you want to check something out during any ECMO runs or anything, but there are digital copies available if anybody wants these ECMO Bibles. Um, today's mission, we're going to talk about ECMO transplant and eCPR. James is going to tell you a little bit about the respiratory pre-workshop and the industry exhibition. I'll tell you about the poster walks and just a nursing, ECMO nursing updates. And then James is going to give us a circulatory support um, feedback as well. And then just a quick closing. So this is what the summary was at the end of the Congress. So 100, 1,000, almost 1,500 people attended this and from 48 countries, even though it was mostly Euro, but they were from all over the world. They submitted 241 abstracts, 60 scientific sessions. We were completely bombarded with information, information overload. No one could attend all of that. <clears throat> and then... 5,400 portions of coffee served, which James and I didn't contribute very much to. Okay, so this one for me was the most powerful thing that I probably learned at this Congress. And they were sharing their... I just want to get rid of this quickly. They were sharing the Euro ECMO guys were sharing their COVID-19... Um, mortality. And you'll see here... There's United Kingdom, France, Spain, Europe and Israel, international, and last was Germany. And please just note how high the mortality rate was of the COVID ECMOs in Germany, which is quite shocking. You, you think Germany is like, to, to me, it's like they're the leaders of, of everything ECMO. They had a 73% mortality rate versus the UK 26. And they are very concerned by these statistics. They presented this themselves. And what they've realized is the difference between these two countries on the ends of each side is the UK has six ECMO centers and Germany has 213 ICUs practicing ECMO. So the message was cohorting all the eggs in one basket for ECMO and having specialized centers that are just doing that instead of everyone's just doing ad hoc ECMO as they like. This is the consequence of having too much resources, I think, in Germany is that anyone can just start up a program at any time. They have access to everything, but look at the mortality rate. So I think, obviously, we need to apply this here as well because we are following the German way <laughs> currently. We need to become the UK. Do you want to say anything about this? Yeah, I think this is repetitive, and we know it's the truth that... Um, because of the fractured nature of healthcare in the private sector in South Africa um, uh, and the attitude to, to ECMO is that you just put the pipes in and it's not and we've got to change that attitude and we've got to centralize ECMO. I think that's clear. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so moving on to transport and ECMO transport specifically now, we've sort of heard sort of a general comment that ECMO retrievals are not really feasible and these patients do worse and 
I don't think anyone's formally studied it, but it's just sort of an experienced expert's opinion, I think we heard in South Africa. But what they actually presented is this study that the outcome is unaffected if you transport it on ECMO. So the retrieval patients versus the in-hospital patients have the same survival rate. So that was quite encouraging for us to actually start and maybe pursue ECMO retrievals a bit more seriously. And obviously, if you've got these small, uh, less centers, you're going to have to have a retrieval program if you're going to do the UK way of just having five or six um, centers instead of the 213, because then you probably don't need a retrieval program if everyone's doing it. But I think the smaller amount of centers with the retrieval program was what they were showing is actually the way to go. They were also speaking about, this was the, the French speaker that was talking about, they even do a 8,000 kilometer ECMO retrieval on this jet to their little islands, Reunion, Martinique, etc., where they've actually fetched 12 patients for ECMO before with good outcomes, okay? with the same outcome. Okay, there were lots of talks about... Um, ECMO retrievals, this was one slide that I just thought was cool. They were just talking about the different ways of fetching these patients, ambulance versus the intensive care uh, transporter and intensive care helicopter. So obviously ambulances, they were saying, are for shorter distance, less than 50 Ks. Um, um, what, can you remember what the intensive care transporter was? Because the next thing is helicopter or ambulance jets. Okay, so that's for up to 600 kilometers. So if we think of South Africa, we know they're doing ECMO. They've got an ECMO center in Johannesburg at Mill Park. They do ECMOs in Cape Town. And if we do Natal, we would cover the 600 kilometer radius. So we could easily look at doing Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. Then I just wanted to show you what resources look like. So this is an ECMO truck. All right, they've got a cath lab inside the back of the truck <laughs> where they do an angiogram and insert the ECMO. So this is for eCPR. Okay, obviously this is not what we're asking for at this stage, but it was just interesting to see a different world. And they do rescue PCI in the back of the truck. So if they do the angiogram and they can open up the patients on VA ECMO, we can open up the culprit vessel. Yeah. Um, if it's possible. Obviously, not complex. I hope Jerron is still listening in the traffic because maybe we could aim to have a JJ and J truck one day. <laughs> uh, they're $18 million, <laughs> the truck. Yeah, only 18 With everything inside. Yeah. So. Definitely think it's possible. <laughs> Okay, and then I, I just wanted to show this slide. It's a bit haphazard in this presentation, but it's quite difficult to explain Harlequin syndrome and the mixing cloud, but someone actually managed to do this brilliant um, echo while... They autogram while we were, there's a mixing cloud going on. I don't know if you guys can see the flow from the bottom, from the left ventricle, through the aortic valve, and then the flow from the descending side of the aorta from the ECMO. And these two competitive flows is what gives us this differential hypoxia or Harlequin syndrome. And I'll definitely be putting this into my training. So I was grateful that you made a video of that. Okay, so this is obviously when your PO2 from your native circulation is worse than the ECMO. And then you have on your first branches of your aortic arch, you have this hypoxic picture so it will be your coronary arteries your right arm and then sometimes even into your brain where you have hypoxia during VA ECMO when the native function restores just as a quick summary of Harlequin syndrome okay okay I'll hand over to James okay um, the, the pre-conference workshop on it was all about respiratory mechanics ventilation um, etc and uh, um, I, I'm sure the names are well known, but the, the chap on the bottom right, I stuck him in there, is a chap called Luigi Camparotto from Guy's Hospital uh, in London. Um, and you would think he would be an Italian. He did his undergraduate training in Italy, um, but he talks like Prince Charles. You know, 
got a lovely English accent. But he really is doing a huge amount of work looking for spiritual mechanics. And um, it gave us, uh, I thought, uh, for me anyway, maybe maybe not for everybody, but um, an incredible assessment of respiratory mechanics and about why ventilation is bad for you and how to minimize the damage, although it saves lives. And um, then the, the next uh, uh, lecture was on, on protective ventilation. Um, and there was a lot of, a huge amount of information, which is sort of beyond the scope of this talk. But um, I asked him for a copy of his talk. He said he'll send them to me because they're quite comprehensive. And it's, he, what he does is the usual thing where he, he takes the actual mechanics he produces the equations to make the mechanics realistic and plausible, um, and then in subsequent talks he was able to to uh, show us how we can ventilate patients better, and I think that's that's really important before the patients need ECMO. So how do you ventilate the patient well enough to avoid ECMO? And um, so much was about what we do to the lungs. The ventilator is not good for the lungs. Um, and obviously for the patient, and it's the driver of, of ARDS is actually the ventilator. Um, and then the whole thing about how much PEEP should you give a patient. Um, and it's, it's sort of been a debate in the literature, and they haven't been able to show uh, um, big differences between how much PEEP you should have, but they then produced this, uh, this is an old, in, from the Journal of Intensive Care Medicine, which shows the that when you mild, moderate, and severe ARDS, um, and that low peep, so low peep must low peep is five and above, and not any of anything less than that. And low peep is for mild lung disease, and high peep is for bad lung disease. Um, and the important other concept that came out of this is we know that not all ARDSs are the same. Uh, traditionally, we've been treating all ARDS as, as the same. And um, they looked at lung morphology. So if you've got diffuse lung disease versus um, focal lung disease, um, use different PEEP strategies and recruitment strategies, and they're able to show a, a significant difference in using personalized lung strategies. So when you've got uh, you know, non-focal lung pathology, use a higher PEEP because what tends to happen you're using a high PEEP with non-focal pathology, with focal pathology, you end up damaging the good lung. So when you've got diffuse lung disease, the ARDS is like we see with viral pneumonias, and uh, it's probably much wiser to use a high PEEP strategy, and that produced a difference in outcome, and that was published in 2019 in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Um, so that, for me, was, was something I didn't know about. And now we move on to the, the, the exhibition. Um, there was quite a lot of interesting stuff. This is the Impeller 5.5, which is a surgically introduced device that you implant into the left heart via the auxiliary artery. Um, and uh, in the, on the left-hand side is the point of care um, TIG. Well, it's, a, it's an equivalent of a TIG. And hopefully we can get that into South Africa and use that as a point of care. So you actually do a thromboelastogram in the ICU at the bedside. And it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then on the right hand side is the drone, which you can use to deliver your um, ECMO machine to remote places. And, and that's uh, from Eurosets, that's there. We would like to get hold of one of these machines, a very compact machine. So if necessary, we can stick it on a drone and fly it to the destination, cannulate the yeah. patient and bring so, it back. I don't know if you can see nicely, but do you see this? This this is the ECMO machine, just that. There's the membrane and that's the pump. Oh. And then what you do is you bring that back and it's called the calibri and you put it back into the adult, the, the big machine if you want, but otherwise you can run the whole ECMO on that machine. And it's fantastically uh, you know, reduced in size and weight, which makes transport really, really easy. This is, 
Is that the thing? Is it that? Oh, wait, wait. So, yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, this is, a, this is the Germans again. Unlimited resources. Unlimited resources. This is their setup for patients that have, called Carl, um, for ECPR. And you see the, I'll oh, go back there. Yeah, it's got two pumps. One pump for pushing <coughs> blood through the oxygenator and a second pump for delivering pulsatile flow to the patient. Yeah. I want to quickly just go back so you guys can see. So this is like the Rolls Royce of the ECMO machines available now. Can you see the inline PO2, CO2? You don't, you've got blood gases on the ECMO machine. And this is their, their, their pictures. This is the best thing ever for ECPR. Yeah. 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 And so they, yeah, they cannulate, put the patient on, get pulsatile flow. They have a priming solution, which is colloid based in order to reduce the amount of um, crystalloid the patients get. Yeah. Um, and they're obviously very excited about it. It'd be lovely to have, yeah. but I think completely unaffordable. Yeah. Like the Impella is completely unaffordable for us. Um, I mean, this would be the order of. I think they said 100,000 euro for this. For the machine. Yeah. <coughs> and then your disposables would probably be. So it's like 2 million rand. Yeah, 2 million rand. So. It also um, can cool the patient down yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. it's active cooling yeah. to 34. All post arrest patients they're cool. It's like a I don't know, Rolls Royce. Nice to okay. Um, this was a really interesting thing. I'm gonna put called, it on. Uh, it's called the Moby box. This is the this is the the driver console. This is the actual pump. And there's a little Pump here, much like the Berlin Heart, it's a pneumatically driven. So you have a cylinder of oxygen or connected to wall oxygen. That's your oxygenator. And you don't need any external power source. There's a little battery in the control. That's your gas or transport. That's and the whole machine. That's then. the whole machine. Oh. So you can cannulate the patient. The, the thing that's unnerving, it doesn't have much in the way of monitoring the device. But it's a pneumatic pump. So it inflates, pushes blood and then deflates and draws blood. So it acts like a normal myocardium, delivers pulse and pulse of our flow. The Berlin part is, works like that. Yeah. And it's very cheap. It's almost like the ideal thing for Africa. Uh, whether it'll gain wide acceptance, I don't know, but they're doing, it's, it's, it's German made, developed by the German. So we think the Germans generally know what they're doing. And so, who knows? Maybe that'll become the standard of care. And the machine is less than half the price of our ECMO machines that we have. Yeah. And the disposables are also significantly cheaper. Yeah, so it only needs like a small little, like a double A battery for the console, but it doesn't need any power just at to all. I give you this. So, you just so for adjust Africa. Flow according to this dial yeah. here. You can do three and a half liters flow, which for in the field uh, uh, is. Amazing. So we'll see what happens with that, but it was quite an exciting thing. And, and it's on, slightly cheaper than our current much mode, yeah, that yeah, we have. Cheaper than what we currently have. Yeah. Maybe we'll be walking around one of these and have them in the back of our car. I mean, it's light. It's two kilograms. So it's, it's lighter than most women's handbags, I think. <laughs> Depending on what they got. Um, and the Protec Duo cannula which is uh, the original uh, cannula for right heart support. In other words, the cannula goes through the internal jugular vein, winds up in the pulmonary artery, and you then give the patient full right heart bypass. Uh, this is kind of the best way to cannulate anybody with right heart failure or respiratory failure. Um, but the cannula itself in South Africa, it's not available. It's over a hundred thousand rand for the cannula. Quantu have now made their dual lumen cannula, and they promise us it's going to be less than half the price of that. So we'll see. It's uh, it, it's something that um, we certainly can use, and it, it makes an enormous difference to the patients in terms of outcomes. Um, I'll show you some stuff later about the efficacy of this as an ECMO support modality.
does everybody understand what we mean by a right heart bypass? That we're actually bypassing the right heart completely. So if the patient's got right ventricular failure from an infarction or there's right heart failure from something else, it bypasses the right heart. So you can actually support the patient's circulation as well as oxygenation. Um, we can later talk about things like LVADs and right heart failure with LVADs. So but, maybe just explain where does this cannula go exactly? Like? Yeah, it's it through, it through the internal jugular vein and yeah. into the pulmonary artery through the tricuspid valve. So for those of you who swan know what a Swan-Gans catheter is, that's where a Swan-Gans catheter goes. Um, and the, the, they said actually putting it in is not that difficult. It's one or two tricks that we were uh, told about and you can deploy it and Patients can actually be mobilized and woken up the next So you're returning the blood straight into the pulmonary yeah. circulation and not depending on the right ventricle. Yeah, the right ventricle it. doesn't need to do anything. Okay. Any questions about this cannula, maybe? Nothing. Okay. Cool. Okay, cool. This these poster walks were one of my favorite things that happened. Um, at the, the Congress. So they had these 10 digital poster stations. Each one of them had like a theme. And then they asked, and it was very inspiring because it was quite a, a young group of researchers that had written papers and these papers were now presented within five minutes. So they had like, how many times, like say, 10 talks, 10 posters presented in an hour. So the 10 speakers are there and then you go and attend whatever theme you're interested in and you get a hell of a lot of information quite quickly. So I did try and take some photos of like the, the best ones. There was one that showed and it was it was cool because I experienced this in COVID. I always said the women do better on ECMO, but it was just my opinion like what I had seen but someone actually studied it and said there's definitely a gender thing with ECMO that women do better yeah so that was cool to see and then I just want to see here this is how it looked it was quite very noisy struggled to hear like this one here in the middle, they presented a single center experience of primary ECMO transportation and mobile ECMO in a team built by two physicians. So it's only two physicians that went to go and retrieve patients. One was the cannulator and one took care of the ECMO itself, like an ECMO specialist. And they presented their results in Spain of how that worked for them. Somebody had worked out here a resuscitation beneficence score. I think this was from America actually. Yeah, so there was very interesting, cool things there. This is uh, just to quickly show you like in one poster walk what you could learn. This was only at one digital poster and it was multidisciplinary. There was nutrition delivery, all sorts of very cool, interesting topics. And then the one I wanted you to see was this one. I don't know if you can see my mouse, no. So that one that they started at 1644, that was very interesting where they showed the risk factors for major neurological events in patients in VV ECMO, a single sense study from Lisbon. Um, and this, this um, here's the paper they, they sent it to us. So basically, um, what they found was that a very fast CO2 variation immediately after cannulation. I think they said less than 50%. So if you drop your PCO2 on your gas by 50% in the first 48 hours, the patient has a much higher risk for a neurological event. So that is something we definitely need to change in our own practice. Um, and this actually won a prize at the Congress, the study. I just want to see if there was something both, else here. Both thrombotic and hemorrhagic. So no. it's not that they bleed, it's they end up with several days of constriction when you drop the CO2 too quickly. Yeah. Um, and so we've got to be a bit Yeah, so I, I did um, put in here the talk that they actually did from Lisbon, but I mean, this is they all do it in Europe now. Paris. They all agreed. 
um, that the way to manage the CO2 in the four, first 48 hours is you tr leave your sweep on one liter to start off with, and you just slowly take your time to bring that CO2 down. Difficult if you've got a, a pH that's acidotic, but we need to put on the brakes a little bit in the first 48 hours was the message. That was new to me, definitely. We've just had a patient put on ECMO last night at the SAN, which we're trying this on already. Yeah. Okay, and then, <coughs> just to, this is a one slide only for the nursing um, talk. I only managed to attend one of them, and it was presented by the unit manager of an, the Paris ECMO Center, and she was talking about the challenges in nursing for ECMO. So they asked for more AI integration to ease the nursing burden. And I was thinking to myself, do these Europeans know what a nursing burden is? That's what I was thinking. I'm just sharing what was in my head. And I was like, these oaks, they don't know what's a nursing burden. Anyway, then they were talking about they need to find ways to make it more attractive to work in these centers because they're struggling to retain staff. And again, I was like, man, what do these oaks know about retaining staff? They asked for creative but simple solutions in the technology and development. They were saying they are bombarded with too much. I don't know if you saw earlier, they're sort of heading towards making a like a, a patient double, a virtual double of the patient on monitoring to show all the things all integrated into one. Too many data points, the nurses were complaining it's getting more and more complicated and they're just not getting time to nurse. So they were asking for more simple uh, developments. Um, and then she shared with us the French nursing ratio. So I just want to ask you guys, how many, what do you think that is in an ECMO center in Paris? It's, the, it's like one of the most world-renowned ECMO centers. What do you think the nursing to patient ratio is? ICU nurse to patient ratio. It's... It, what, what do you think it is in Paris, in the best ECMO sensor? It, because they obviously have a fusion of a lot of other people working with them, so maybe three patients to one nurse? Three patients to one nurse. How do we do it here? We, we try to aim for two to one patient. Eh? So across the board in Paris, regardless if it's an ECMO sensor, a transplant, a medical ICU, a ICU, it's one patient, one nurse to 2.5 patients. So they're actually in a worse situation than we are. But like Kat says, they do have more support from the multidisciplinary team. Like, I didn't ask the specific center, but we, we know that in the first world, in a lot of places like the inotropes, for example, will become pre-mixed from the pharmacy. So there are some duties that maybe are less than here. But I was quite surprised to see the nursing ratio. Um, I don't know if I would cope with this myself to look after two ECMO, two and a half ECMO. So if me and my buddy look after five ECMOs. <laughs> it seems crazy. Huh? And the Germans are exactly the same. They reported the same. So this is right through Europe. And we've heard like in North America, Canada, a lot of programs are actually closing because of the nursing shortage. But the yeah. management mustn't get too many ideas. <laughs> Don't get ideas. Yeah. Don't get ideas. <laughs> yeah. We need to ask more, more questions perhaps about how exactly it works there. Um, also, they said the pay grade is exactly the same. They don't get any extra money for nursing ECMO patients. That's why they're struggling to retain their staff. So it's just if you're interested in ECMO, you work here. That's it. And she was actually saying at the end of their COVID experience, the government gave them 100 euros each, which is 2,000 rand as a thank you. That's it. That's all that happened. They didn't get a pay increase or they just got that bonus. So I, I, I feel like, um, not that we got anything, right? But I think we sometimes think that things are going like extremely well on this side, perhaps in nursing, but not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> I was quite shocked. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. 
And then maybe I will I'll do it a bit, you know, at another later stage. But this made an impression on me. This top uh, right, they shared a picture that a ECMO survivor actually drew and they were just talking about everyone's pushing for a lot of awake ECMO hours on all the ECMO runs but this is what the patient experienced when he was awake on ECMO and these words here like without voice field of view restriction um, being cold all the time and not being able to communicate this, right? No explanations, motionless, delirium, fear, pain, um, the noise. And you can see this person was mentally tortured, basically. I just thought we, we don't even think about this part, you know, often. We just try and get the patient hemodynamics right. But sure, this is a huge, huge component of the care yeah so um, yeah sorry also this Paris setup they bring the staff for an eight hour exposure session to the unit so they work for free for eight hours just to you know just supernumerary and they check it out and if they're interested then they are taken on for five weeks in a supernumerary capacity so that's quite cool which we don't have so they get intense training a high fidelity training i don't know if you can see these little pictures here but it's a very realistic uh wet lab that they've got there and then after that five weeks of orientation and training then they start okay here's james's Okay, so this was just on the on the mechanical support side from cardiogenic shock and um, when to consider ECMO and cardiogenic shock. I think everybody sort of refers a patient generally too late, but the idea is to have your shock T, and I, I've been on about this for a while. If you want to get better outcomes, you need a shock team. We, we, it's logical, but it's actually it's evidence-based. It was published by, I think this is... Uh, Schrager's group um, showing the shock team cohort does better and that you should like everything else you have to have a team which should consist of heart failure cardiologist, heart failure surgeon and um, obviously here we probably have interventional and heart failure rolled into one um, and intensivist um, probably anaesthetist would be what we would do um, and all of these things and um, early referral uh, and you know you need you need um, you know, central arterial access. You should have a cardiac output monitor in the form of a Swan GANS catheter, and um, and then decide on what's going to be the best support for the patient. That is, if you want to try and and turn around with very high mortality, I've got a mortality in excess of eighty percent, um, probably closer to ninety percent in in our setting. Um, in the control cohort, they've got the mortality down to 60%. So there's a substantial difference. It's all about early intervention. Um, and then they just took the, lo the longer you delay, the worse the patients do. So again, it gets down to early referral. And early referral means um, 0.9 hours, so less than an hour. Um, they do better than if you wait two hours. Uh, and obviously, much better than if you wait 24 hours. So most of the time we've been asked to see patients 24, 48 hours being hammered with inotropes and they all, they all die. So but this is again in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an expert center, and we're by no means anywhere there, but we should start with the right principles for these patients. So that's less than 60 minutes? Yeah, less than an hour. Yeah. Um, this was this is a very uh, interesting guy, um, Mark Maybauer, and he's got all of these appointments in Queensland and Florida, um, and and he used the the Protect Duo in in his uh, COVID ECMOs, and he had a nearly ninety percent survival with the Protect Duo cannula, um, and this is showing you the Protect Duo, which you can see. Um, goes in the neck and it goes right through into the pulmonary valve here. And so here it is sitting in the pulmonary artery. And there's your ECMO circuit outside. So it's, it's like an Avalon cannula, but you're putting it right across the tricuspid valve. And he's um, 
published in it, uh, probably the most published guy on this, and I think most people are seeing that it's an, an excellent way to do it, but obviously requires a little bit more complex, a little bit more gymnastics, and obviously has to be done preferably with um, radiology imaging, so ideally done in a cath lab or a hybrid theater. Or in the ECMO truck. Or in the ECMO truck. Yeah. We're going to get two. And this is the other, you know, I mean, the, the, the number of permutations now, you, you know, we've all heard about impeller, which is, you know, the small impeller, which is put in through the groin, the, that's the 2.0, and that's useful for low flows, and then for higher flows, you need the 5.0, 5.5 pump, which is usually implanted surgically, so you can then do biventricular support with, with impeller. So they call it. I think I'm not sure whether we'll ever get in pellets in South Africa unless they can drop the price. There, I think each one is over two hundred thousand rand, um, even for the for the small one. The surgically implanted one is um, a shorter device put in through the axillary artery. But uh, that's enough. But just to show you what you can do with with the Protect Duo Plus uh, an impeller. You can take someone in biventricular failure. You can you can salvage, optimize, and either recover them or transplant them. Um, and then this again is a repeat of the earlier thing: extracorporeal membrane oxygenation with the SARS um, in COVID-19. And what they showed is that bad ECMO is worse than conventional ventilation. Um, so it comes down to trying to establish high volume centers. I think everybody knows that, but we kind of, it, it's quite hard to get people to change their, their attitude to ECMO because their experience has been bad. Um, or they just say, well, you just put them on um, and the results are bad. So we should rather not do any ECMO uh, if we're not going to do it in a uh, referral centre. Again, this is you know, evidence-based medicine. And how do we make ECMO better, looking at VV ECMO? And this was, I think, all our COVIDs referred so late after a long period of non-invasive ventilation. And we know the patients that declined ventilation did very badly because by the time they got ventilated, they usually were septic and the lungs were worse. So when you put them on the ventilator, they either decompensated or the ventilation was injurious. So don't think that the not on the vent means that they're okay. It doesn't. They've clearly shown that. And that's now histologically and uh, mechanically been shown so-called silly self-induced lung injury, um, low anticoagulation regime, crack bacterial syndrome, personalized and monitor mechanical ventilation. That was the message from all of these uh, experts that you've got to spend time at the bedside with the ventilator. You don't set the ventilator and come back two days later. You've actually got to look at it and change it according to the patient's need. Uh, again, do ECMO and experience centers, and what Renee was saying, psychological and post-ICU discharge is hugely important. These patients are traumatized by this, and we certainly saw it, that some patients wake up fine, others wake up crazy, and there's lots of reasons for that. A lot of it depends upon what you've done to them with the ECMO, and what sort of their, their pre-morbid functioning was like. Um, and then the clear thing is to include ECMO patients in randomized controlled trials because they are lacking in ECMO. And a lot of um, the guidelines are, are actually just expert opinions, but the randomized controlled trials are coming out. There is a randomized controlled trial starting now looking at, at uh, APRV ventilation versus other modes of ventilation in AODS. And you would have thought that would have happened a long time ago, but it hasn't. And it's starting, it's going to take three years to get those results. And then 
this is the, the Paris model, which we've spoken about a lot. We should build an efficient hub and spoke network. Here you can see in, in, in Paris again, uh, the 213 mobile intervention. And it just shows you uh, <clears throat> there's places where they can, they can manage ECMO with no cannulation, to cannulate an ECMO management, and then they move them all to the central hospital. So they I mean, did huge numbers of ECMO and they had very good results. It got better as, as it went by. They had a patient selection, but um, I think that's, that's what we should be doing, trying to do at least with ECMO in, in South Africa, certainly VV ECMO. And that's that. Um, there's actually a thing here, sorry. It's fast here. Yeah. Put the sound on. Okay. Need the echo. Um. <laughs> I think we were the only South Africans there. No, we were the only South Africans there. Yeah. Get it with the sound, to which you make Got to do it with the Zoom hosting. Mm. Oh. That was very impressive. That small, compact, cheap ECMO. Simple. Did you get the contact detail for the company that, that makes that? The cannula. The emo, yeah. Alan. Alan. No, 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 the Moby box. Yeah, Alan we do. Alan. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's got um, C model, not FDA. But it's in a few months. The cannula's got FDA C. This was a dietitian that presented her paper on nutritional deficiency of VV ECMOs. Hmm. Oh, something that we didn't include that I just remembered is they were talking about the complete artificial heart. Yeah, on it. And, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know you got such a but, but, uh, total, total, total cardiac. So. Oh. Well, it's a big problem, is replacing failing parts. But this was the, the, the chap from uh, Berlin, Popatov. He's a, he's, he was a surgeon. He was a real surgeon. Everything was just like, you know, black and white. Thing. Uh, implanting his uh, impellers and everything just uh, not a problem. Not a problem. Put them on the impeller, send them to the ward. Yeah. End stage heart. Does anyone have any questions or comments? There's a there's a huge amount more information if anyone's interested, especially on hemostasis and ventilation. And thank you very much. But your talk, well, the talk on transporting patients, showing safety, was that pre ECMO or was it a mix? Patients on ECMO or patients waiting to get an ECMO? So it's retrieval programs. So the yeah. patient's not on ECMO? No. Yeah. Can so you go retrieve? put the patient on ECMO and bring them to the, okay. the ECMO centre? So Ben, I don't want to step on anyone's toes here, but two things that are clear. It's single centre yeah. and retrieving is safe. 
Yes. So should we not move Mansberg to one hospital? If yeah. retrieval is safe, there's this resistance to moving patients from St. Anne's to Medicaid and from Wilson to Medicaid and vice versa. Yes. But if we don't do that, we can't expect the peripheries to be sending us patients. Mm. If we can't show that, we won't even do it a five minute chance. Mm. There's a resistance to do it because we're so close. Yeah. But it's proved that being in one hospital, one building, mm. is the way forward. Yes. So should so we not be pushing to do that? We have. So within and I'm not, I'm within not putting it all on you. No, 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 no. But within the our practice, this is what we've been trying to do for yeah. like over a year, and nobody wants to give us a, a proper home or beds. Yeah. So we've now finally got our ECMO center in Saint Augustine's. So we should be moving all our patients there. That's why we're doing our training program at them. We've got a ECMO hub there now. Yeah. That's going to so be the hub. Big patients as well. They Every, should be moved there. So we can we can put them on here, but yeah. we should move them there. That's the idea. So we had so just to be transparent, we had this huge talk now about this patient that's at St. Anne's to move there. But because of his pathophysiology of, of having this risk of having tension pneumothoraces, we thought it might be in his case maybe not such a good idea and rather be very close to him. Um, but any patient going forward, we should actually be moving them to one hospital, like you say. And we're, we're going. We're, we're supposed to get some dedicated beds for ECMO. Yeah. Just we've never been able to get anyone to give us, yeah. because I think, you know, the the hospital groups. Um, the only one that has experience with ECMO centres is Netcare, mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, because you know if. I think if MediClinic, we tried very hard with MediClinic to get them to give us a definitive space, but they are not convinced about ECMO at the, in the head office. All decisions are made down in the head office. Um, so I, I think that's that's the reality. Whereas, you know, um, between Unitas and, and Milk Park, they've got a, a huge ECMO experience. And that's, you know, why they are a little bit more pro the idea of establishing a proper ECMO centre. And I think the sand makes more sense because it's got all the other ancillary stuff inside. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're supposed to give us some beds to actually do it properly. Because I think, as I see, if you're not going to do it properly, you shouldn't do it. But everybody's sticking canyons into everybody still. Yeah. And the mortality is well in excess of 80 percent. And the only people that you can get that from is from industry will tell you. The mortality is 80 percent. So yeah, it's it's the idea, and it's not that the amount of work that somebody will lose is very small. You know, often the financial incentive is a, is a, a real interference in decision making, but if what you've got to do is establish a credible ECMO program and then people will support you. So it's kind of trying to get the cart before the horse. Yeah. So you've got to actually get some support from somebody and get some good outcomes and then people might say, okay, well, fine. But in the meantime, they'll say, well, I'm, I can do it. Yeah. And that's private practice. Private practice is inherently corrupt. We know that because there's a financial incentive um, and ultimately it's not what it's about. It's business. So the idea, this is how, what you do in an environment where they've got, you know, regional, national health centers. Um, you know, we, we need to try and bridge that psychologically to try and get people to say, okay, fine. Maybe they can do it. I mean, people maybe don't want to think anyone can do it better than them because, you know, in private practice, you audit yourself. Yeah. We've got to get people to say, well, maybe they can do it better. And we've had a good, hard look at our ECMOs, and we certainly know which ones have done badly and why. And we can we can do better, definitely. But you've got to get everybody else to look at it the same way. Yeah. Tenancy is very late referral still. Yeah. Especially for VA. VA is late, but also v, all the VVs have been very late. I must, I must say this patient we put on yesterday was the absolute perfect referral two days ago. Patient was fine, not just a thing. Infiltrate started coming, and I think everything was fine. She was eating McDonald's, and I met phone and said, This lady's 
difficult. Now, how long was she ventilated? 45 minutes before the referral. Yeah, well, he called me while he was ventilating. It took me 45 minutes to get there. Yeah. But well, that's too long. Yeah. Yeah, too long. Let me get yeah, to it. <laughs> I think, but we've got to be serious. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got yeah. to realize that, you know, uh, one hour of injurious ventilation yeah. affects outcomes. We, with our patient little boy uh, up the road, it was the same thing. I was involved before intubation. Um, so he was ventilated for 48 hours on very protective ventilation and then popped his pneumothorax. So he was an early referral as well. So hopefully we can show that early referral is key. The re argument can always be made that, well, maybe they didn't need ECMO anyway, which is also the other thing we hear. But I mean, the compliance on this, like with this, I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. The patient's compliance was like six months. But the argument could be made if ventilate them hard for a couple of days, it would be better. You know, it's still got to change the mindset that, and this in Paris, what they were doing, they're getting a patient like that, they didn't even intubate them. They just put them straight onto ECMO without intubation. And so they never intubated. Positive pressure ventilation injures the lungs. And then Bruce is the expert on that side of things. Yeah. So, I'm an expert on injury in yeah. lungs, yes. So, so, you know, it's, it's changing the way we think about ventilation. Um, and if we can get patients on ECMO early and extubate them, that's the gold standard. And then yeah. you can get them actually out of bed and walking around while they're on ECMO. I mean, when you went to Milan, that's what they did. They put the patient on ECMO and extubated them. And they were eating breakfast on ECMO. Give them more McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Hmm. Yeah. No, it was just very instructive. I think it's the nice thing about ECMO. I think it's got a, a the, the the future um, of of membrane oxygenation and carbon dioxide uh, extraction is is quite bright, and there are new machines on the side. Uh, you know, so I think that that um, VV in particular requires um, one set of skills. VA ECMO requires another set of skills. Probably, you know, to try and keep them both under one roof would be ideal. VA ECMO is a little bit more of a critical emergency that you see the arrest ECPR or in hospital arrests. Um, young patients, young patients that arrest in the ward. Start CPR and call the ECMO team. The orthopedic surgeons, patients, the gynae patients that have pulmonary emboli and are dying, you can save their lives. And the young people get better. And I think that's the other clear thing they show. Younger, less than 45, very, very good survival. They also did show that, that high quality CPR. So we need the mechanical um, compressions machine. Are you serious about doing ECPR? ECPR. In hospital arrest, the, should, the, the team should be the shock team. In hospital arrest, then call the shock team. Because you can put these patients on ECMO on the floor while you're doing CPR. Yeah. That's if you want to. I mean, you know, you can save some of those people. It's a question of of how aggressive you would like somebody to be to see your 78 year old patient, not a good idea. But your 45 year old patient, they're all younger than me, they should get a chance. I think, anyway. You must do it as if you are. Your loved one, yeah. yeah. They're always in nursing. If this was your mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we at the hospital, uh, I mean, for the hospital, shouldn't they thinking about at least getting one of those automated CPR machines? Because ultimately... We should, I think, my you vision... the patients up and you free one But where are we going to put it? Where will we put it? We must put it on our ECMO truck or on the helicopter for the retrieval. I mean, that's for, yeah... But yes. well, what I'm saying in general, like, you know, in case they have, they have, but it we is were telling the men, but yeah. Mm. 
because I mean, ultimately, they got they AC, always AC have a CPR that's happening anyway. We can convince uh, Medica to get one, get two. We just need to see the cost of it. Because well, of course, it's, uh, if they're willing to get it, it would be great to have yeah. it everywhere. But yeah. I think, as a bare minimum, we should have it in our no, retrieval yeah, program. Correct. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So, Dr. Kilpatrick, are you going to be part of our retrieval program? Send it from a T to how how do how's your nausea in a helicopter? That's good. <laughs> Ideally, yes, but how to structure it? Yeah, we also yeah. need to do a lot of outreach in the two target yeah. provinces, so that we get these early referrals. VA under sixty minutes, we have yeah. to be there, on put them on ECMO within sixty minutes. It's going to be quite. But well, I guess a that's, that's all part of the Saint Augustine. Uh, they, they do have uh, transportation if that becomes a center, just like MOPA. They go out there, they fly you out there, they insert and you retrieve and you go back there. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I don't see this place happening because I, I don't see any effort of being put in, into creating a center that alone dedicated beds with the transportation. It's okay. Um, I think overall it's actually worked out for the best. I think the San is actually the right place with their five ICUs and yeah, yeah, they're just a bigger center. Yeah. I think it actually makes sense. If you're going to do one specialized center, that's probably the right place for KZN. Yeah, so I, I think it's that. actually worked out okay. But we obviously need the support. These are going to be the spoke hospitals of the hub and spoke. And we still need... The people at any hospital don't need to know about it. Yeah. But it's going to, but cannulation is still going to be here. You, you know what I'm saying? The initial yeah. management is still going to be here. All hill trips, yes. all web, or cox. So that everybody needs to be integrated. In. So we need to stop seeing ourselves as. Yes, of course. And we need the whole multidisciplinary team for thinking about when is this patient an ECMO candidate. We need everyone to be thinking. And we'll obviously invite whoever refers to be part of the case, even though it's at another hospital. Okay, cool. That's the idea. Very inspired. Let's do it. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay, goodbye everyone that joined us online. Thank you very much for taking the time. We'll see you again. Bye.